Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you very much to Corrado and, and the team for organizing this fascinating day. Um, it's really a great honor to be with you and to join you um, from here in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, uh, so I'm going to be speaking about the uh, social determinants of mental health in refugee and other vulnerable populations. And I'm very pleased to be following uh, Pim's talk. Um, it's a tough act to follow because it was a great talk, but I think it does actually segue quite nicely into thinking about the social determinants of mental health and how we mount interventions to, to address them, because I think the prevention agenda is very high uh, on, uh, on this whole area. So here's a quick outline of my talk. Um, I'm gonna start off by just giving you a bit of background about some key recent developments in global mental health, um, and then introduce you to the concepts of the social determinants of mental health and how they link with the sustainable development goals I wanna share with you a framework that we developed and published a couple of years ago, um, and then outline some potential priorities for intervening to address social determinants of mental health, um, especially in low resource settings. Um, and then focus finally on some of the key challenges and opportunities uh, in this field. So it's a very exciting time to be working in this area. Over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, we've seen a huge amount of work that has gone into scaling up mental health care, especially in low and middle income countries. And WHO has really led the charge with the MHGAP program, uh, which is now in over a hundred countries. And as many of you know, the MHGAP program is WHO's flagship program for integrating mental health into primary care and general health services and uh, scaling up to meet the needs of, of larger populations. And given what we know about the massive treatment gap uh, for mental health conditions, especially in low and middle income countries. This is really long overdue. And uh, behind this, this work uh, at the policy and service level has been a, a huge amount of research. And here are some of the logos of, of some of the studies and I've been involved in some of this work um, to evaluate uh, the implementation of mental health services, often using non-specialist uh, health providers in, in task sharing models. Um, so really a burgeoning field, a huge growth in trials, also a huge growth in implementation science around how we take these interventions to scale, um, which is very important. How, however, um, many of these interventions are delivered in very challenging environments like the environments that you can see in this slide. Uh, these are pictures from Kailicha, which is a large uh, peri-urban township uh, settlement, not far from where I'm, I'm speaking to you today. Um, and during uh, 2011 to 2016, we conducted a randomized control trial uh, in this community where we evaluated the delivery of a task sharing psychological intervention uh, delivered by community health workers for women with uh, antenatal and postnatal depression. And um, it, was, it was a very challenging uh, environment to work in. And, and what was often striking about the narratives that we would hear when we, we screened women for the trial and, and we would uh, hear accounts of, of women who met all the diagnostic criteria uh, for depression, but their narratives were very much uh, caught up with the challenging social and economic circumstances in which they lived. Uh, they would talk about uh, inadequate water and sanitation, uh, poor housing, uh, high levels of inequality, South Africa being one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, high levels of violence, especially gender-based violence, uh, food insecurity, um, of course now exacerbated through COVID, um, high levels of unemployment, and also migration. Many women had migrated to uh, Cape Town in search of work from the rural Eastern Cape. So we saw in these narratives that experience of depression was completely intertwined with experience of poverty and social and economic uh, disadvantage and, and the question that immediately arises is, is one which I think Michael Marmot said, which is why offer people treatments only to send them back to the conditions that made them sick in the first place? Um, and this is something that's really um, preoccupied me more and more in, in recent years. Um, and, and really with these women's experience, experience is, um, is very much in keeping with the epidemiological evidence. We um, published this uh, systematic review back in 2010 and we asked the simple question, is there an association between common mental disorders and poverty? 
And we found in the vast majority of the 76 community-based studies in this review that there was a significant, statistically significant association between a variety of measures of poverty and common mental disorders. And, and this was not only increased prevalence, but also increased severity, longer course, and worse outcome. And it was true in both bivariate and multivariate analyses. So this then raises the question, um, how should we go about trying to address these social determinants? Of course, it's a, co a complex picture. Uh, many of these studies were cross-sectional, so we don't really know yet a whole lot about the direction of these uh, causal pathways. Um, do social and adverse social and economic conditions cause uh, mental health problems? Or on, on the other side, do people living with mental health conditions tend to drift into uh, poverty as a result of the disability of their condition, uh, increased health expenditure? Um, and also stigma uh, associated with these conditions. So this is something that obviously needs to be unpacked. Um, but it leads to the question, what are these social determinants and how can we go about uh, defining them? So in this paper, which we published a couple of years ago as an offshoot of the uh, Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development, we define social determinants as the social and economic conditions that have a direct influence on the prevalence and severity of mental disorders in males and females across the life course. And this includes uh, three really important uh, elements. The first is the structural, social and economic arrangements which confer advantage or disadvantage on particular populations. Secondly, and closely related to this, the differential exposure to adverse life events um, and then uh, also the specific conditions of vulnerability and resilience that these arrangements and exposures produce. So it's often a combination of uh, social and economic position and differential exposure to adverse life events that leads to an increased prevalence uh, in mental health conditions in a given population. So um, obviously this is a highly complex area and many of these social determinants interact in complex ways. So what we try to do in this paper is, is to develop a kind of conceptual framework to really try and map out um, some of these determinants and, and try and organize them in a, in a conceptually clear way. Um, we, we basically identified five main domains of the social determinants, and these include uh, the demographic domain, the economic domain, the neighborhood domain, the characteristics of the neighborhood and the community that you live in over and above the characteristics of the individuals who live in that community. Uh, the environmental events domain and the social and cultural domain. And uh, these domains exert uh, their influence on the mental health of individuals across the life course from pregnancy through to old age through a number of distal factors and then more proximal factors. So for example, in the, if we take the economic domain, um, economic recessions uh, influence mental health uh, through the more proximal experience of debt, financial strain, uh, relative deprivation, unemployment, and, and food insecurity. And what we try to highlight in this paper was that many of these domains are actually fairly closely aligned with some of the uh, sustainable development goals. And we try to argue that in addressing some of these um, sustainable go development goals, there is at least the potential to have an influence on, on population mental health. And uh, into the COVID era, these, these factors become even more relevant. So we know that between 71 and 100 million people will be driven into extreme poverty uh, during the course of 2020. Uh, there's a massive widening in, in income inequality, uh, growth in food insecurity, and also in gender-based violence in particular settings. So um, this whole area of the social determinants and how we intervene to address them um, is even more pressing uh, under the COVID um, pandemic. So this then leads us to the question, how should we actually go about intervening to address some of these social determinants? And uh, in uh, late 2019, the UK Academy of Medical Sciences and the Inter-Academy Partnership convened a meeting on the social determinants of global mental health. And there were around 70 people attended this meeting from uh, over 30 countries. Um, and we went through a process of um, trying to identify what the intervention priorities might be for each of these five main domains. Um, 
And uh, Kelly, Clark, Kelly Rose Clark uh, led a very nice paper summarizing the findings from this meeting. Um, and these are just some of the examples of, of potential intervention priorities in the demographic domain, uh, intervening to address and prevent gender-based violence. Um, in the economic domain, social protection interventions like cash transfers, uh, which are now widely used uh, in many low and middle income countries and actually have been enhanced in many countries under COVID. Uh, urban renewal programs uh, or housing programs at, at the neighborhood level, uh, improving disaster responsiveness in, in the environmental events domain, and building social capital and social trust in the social and cultural domain. So um, there's a lot of potential here. Um, uh, Rochelle Burgess has, has written some very nice papers really calling for action to try and address or develop social interventions uh, for global mental health. And, um, She's highlighted the need for community empowerment, for adding mental health outcomes to uh, economic or social development interventions, uh, fostering community ownership of intervention design, trying to combine action on social interventions with health systems interventions, and also examining interactions between health, social, economic, um, uh, and other and um, mental health outcomes over time. So this is all very well, it's exciting, and it's, it's something that I think we should be thinking about more of. The, you know, it, it all hangs together as an argument. Um, but as I think Pim was commenting in relation to prevention interventions, as soon as we start to try and think about how we might design these interventions, and particularly when we start to think about how we might evaluate them, a whole range of challenges uh, begin to emerge. And, um, the first is that often the interventions are quite distal to the mental health outcomes. Uh, for example, if we were to uh, develop an urban renewal program, um, it might be very difficult to show the link to particular mental health improvements, for example, among older adults or, or youth in those communities. Um, secondly, the mechanisms by which uh, interventions to address social determinants influence mental health outcomes are poorly understood. We have actually quite weak theoretical models. We don't really understand a lot about the mechanisms. Um, thirdly, uh, mounting these interventions and, and evaluating them really requires a very strong interdisciplinary approach, um, which can be challenging. Um, fourthly, there are very limited available data sets that allow us to evaluate the effectiveness of these interventions. There are very few randomized controlled trials, um, especially in low and middle income countries. And even though there has been a burgeoning of some, uh, for example, poverty reduction interventions, such as cash transfers, often mental health outcomes, if they're measured at all, uh, are measured as secondary outcomes with uh, instruments of questionable cultural validity. So um, there really is a need to try and include some mental health outcomes, but it's not really being done that well. Uh, next, there are a whole range of ethical challenges. You can imagine uh, trying to intervene to improve food insecurity by introducing food parcels or feeding schemes and having to withhold some of those interventions for populations that desperately need them. Um, this is a really tricky area. Um, and also we need more clarity on how we might go about um, uh, cl uh, clearly identifying who would be eligible for universal selective and indicated prevention interventions in the context of these uh, social determinants interventions and, and Pim has already spoken to some of this. And then finally, there are a whole lot of challenges for research funders uh, to support interdisciplinary research and also to convene inter interdisciplinary review panels um, that are able to um, really assess the merits of, of funding applications. So um, I wanted to suggest some potential approaches to overcome some of these difficulties. And really, this is the start of, of a conversation. I'd be very interested to hear in the, in the discussion uh, what uh, comments people might have. Um, but I think it's important, first of all, to begin with building more uh, clear theoretical models, really trying to understand both at a distal level and then also at a more proximal level, in, including neuropsychological processes how these um, social interventions might influence mental health outcomes. Secondly, uh, and, and these are not necessarily sequential, there can be some, some going back and forth, but in a second step, we need to test specific mechanisms that are hypothesized in these hypothesized uh, causal pathways. 
And thirdly, we need to pool data across multiple sites. And, and we then, in order to do that, we need to develop common metrics, common ways of thinking about mechanisms and common ways of measuring outcomes. And also common ways of, of designing interventions to make them comparable um, across uh, diverse uh, cultural settings. So here's just an, an illustration of, of how this might look. If, for example, we were to introduce cash transfers for refugee youth, uh, we'd need to design specific studies around how we might think uh, these cash transfers lead to particular changes in neuropsychological processes, for example, around self-regulation, and how these in turn might lead to a particular outcome, say the prevention of depression. Um, so this requires um, a high level of consensus or, or on plausible causal pathways, um, a higher level of cooperation and data sharing across sites, um, especially because context really does matter in these interventions. And also, as I mentioned, uh, a high level of interdisciplinarity. We need to be, bring in behavioral economists uh, with mental health practitioners, with people who are epidemiologists and, and trialists. Um, so as I come to the end of my talk, I, I want to um, just give, share with you some of uh, the examples of some of the work that we're doing in this, in this area at the moment. Um, the, the one example is, is from a project called Chances 6. Um, this is being led by Sarah, Sarah evans Latsko from the London School of Economics and, and Political Science. And uh, in this study, we're looking at the effects of cash transfers on youth mental health and their life chances. And we are utilizing existing cohort data sets from six countries. And these are Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, uh, Liberia, Malawi, and South Africa. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a really fascinating project. It's very challenging in the sense that a lot of these cohorts, or in fact, most of them were not set up as randomized controlled trials. So we are looking at single, co single group cohorts over time, and we're having to um, use a variety of different measures or me methods like regression discontinuity design or instrumental variable analyses to try and control for confounding. And we really are finding quite a complex uh, picture in which some cash transfers do seem to convey some mental health benefits, but not always. And a lot depends on context. A lot depends on the conditionality of the grants uh, on the, uh, the volume and the targeting of those cash transfers as well. Um, secondly, um, uh, we have a grant proposal under review at the moment to try and examine some of the neuropsychological mechanisms of poverty and then design interventions accordingly, design interventions that particularly target some of these mechanisms. So I'll hopefully know in the next two or three weeks uh, what the outcome of that is and whether we're able to take that forward. Um, and then uh, finally, um, in the asset study, um, we are trying to integrate social interventions into health system strengthening. So uh, ASSET is, a, is an NIHR funded study working in four sub-Saharan African countries. It's being led by uh, Martin Prince at King's College London. And uh, I'm leading one work package uh, in which we are trying to integrate routine screening and referral for antenatal depression anxiety and domestic violence in midwife obstetric units uh, in Cape Town. And um, really what we're trying to do is introduce and, and integrate a social intervention, which is really around the management of domestic violence uh, with a counseling intervention uh, delivered by non-specialist community health workers. So in terms of moving forward, uh, I think there's a lot of potential for future research in this area. Really, we need more longitudinal epidemiological studies in low middle income countries to give us a better understanding of the uh, intergenerational transmission of poverty and mental illness, um, the mechanisms of poverty and mental health over time, uh, the links between gender poverty and mental health across the life course, and also very importantly, the links between genetic, biological and socioeconomic risk factors. Um, but also importantly, we need to develop uh, intervention studies to target uh, distal and more specific proximal mechanisms, for example, cash transfers combined with psychological interventions. And I was, I was very pleased to hear Vitsa this morning talking about the potential, and I think Mark and Amarin as well, talking about the potential for combining interventions like self-help plus with um, other um, social assistance or social protection programs. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of potential for doing trials 
in which we evaluate the individual, uh, out, sorry, the outcomes of the, each of these components separately, but also look at combining them um, and looking at interactions over time. Um, and then there are also potential for intervention studies targeting more distal mechanisms like living environment improvements, um, particularly in the context of refugee populations. But this really requires, as I mentioned, a, a very interdisciplinary approach. Um, and then finally, um, there are a whole lot of challenges around implementation. I don't think we're there yet, um, especially in, in low and middle income countries. Um, but this really requires multi-sectoral collaboration between a range of different government departments and between a range of different international development agencies. Um, I'm involved in a project in Ghana at the moment called the Ghana Sumubi Dumadie, which is uh, really focusing on mental health and disability in Ghana. And uh, we're trying to find links between the, the social protection program um, and uh, programs to integrate mental health into uh, district demonstration sites. Um, so that's how we're doing it on a more of an implementation uh, side. So really just to conclude, I, th I think this is a kind of a call to action and maybe many of you are already doing this. Uh, I'm late in the day, but I do think that we need to be doing more uh, to broaden the global mental health agenda to address social determinants, uh, particularly for refugees and, and vulnerable populations. Uh, I think very importantly, this is not an either or, it's not saying social determinants are more important than treatment interventions or than uh, prevention interventions that use psychosocial um, uh, approaches, we really need both. And as I mentioned, we need, we, there's a lot of potential for integrating these interventions, particularly um, in a targeted way. But this requires uh, interdisciplinary approaches, as I mentioned, and, and very strong community participation and empowerment. So thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, this is just to acknowledge uh, some of the funders of our recent work and look forward to hearing any uh, questions or comments you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Anna.